I, uh, I find it interesting how oftentimes, uh, maybe, maybe you've discovered this too, that in order to best or, or, or most fully understand what is, you have to first understand what was. Um, to, to order to understand the present, we have to look pretty deeply at the past. The story of, of our history has this unique ability to, to shed light into our current reality. Um, for instance, and, and, and maybe you've seen this, but for, if, if you want to understand the story of a corporation or a business, you'll, you'll oftentimes have to understand the beginning, what motivated them, what their core values were. As they launched, Apple Computers is a perfect example of this, right? They're, they're big fans of, of telling the story of their humble beginnings and how their, their two founders launched this multi-billion dollar corporation out of Steve Jobs' family garage in the mid-1970s. Um, they lean on that. They lean on that history in that story um, because they want to continue to shape who they are presently they want their employees to know and to maintain the same sort of spirit of innovation and creativity that they believe existed in that garage some 40 years ago. So they tell the story. Oftentimes corporations will have, have timelines or they'll have pictorial sort of histories predominantly displayed because they want everyone that works in that place to have a greater understanding of how they arrived there. They want their past to help inform where they're going. We do the same thing, I think, with, with people all the time. As individuals, if you really want to know somebody, if you want to know something about them, we get to know their family. We learn about the community that they grew up in and about what factors ultimately shaped their personalities and their dreams. If, if you wanted to know more about me, then you would need to travel back with me to, to a small town in rural Ohio on the far southwest side of the state where you could get anywhere that you needed to go in 15 minutes by hopping on your bike. Where the highlight of the summer, any summer, was the county fair and what took place there. Where as a little leaguer you would feel like a major leaguer because your whole team would be cheered and waved at as you drove slowly through the streets and the back of your coach's 1970 El Camino uh, for the Little League Parade. I was raised around family, around aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents, and all of these things shaped me. They all are a part of, of who I am, my values, my worldview. And in many ways, my, my dreams, my ambitions, and how I raise my own family. To understand who I am now, you need to know who I was then. I think that this is also true for us as the church. Across the world, there are literally thousands of denominations with an estimated 2 billion people who identify themselves as Christians. You can find every kind of worship style, every kind of preaching possible, and yet in many ways we are very, very different. But if we name the name of Christ as our Savior, then we trace our beginning right back here to Acts chapter 2. Additionally, if we are to understand our own identity as a church, as the church, how did we get here? What has brought us to this place? We've talked a lot about that in Growing to Serve, understanding our history, that God has put us here. If we are to live out the call and the purpose that God has given us, then we need to understand our history, our beginnings, to make sure that we remain aligned with the vision that God had set before us from the very beginning. If we are to understand who we are, then we should be able to have and understand where we came from. This brings us back to Acts chapter 2. As a church, I think um, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know this, but we're in the beginnings of a series, a nine-month study of the book of Acts, which interestingly enough is, is a record of the birth and the growth of the church. 
It's the story of our beginnings. And it is the utmost importance in shaming and shaping and informing who we are and what we are to be about today. Well, this is why this is so vital. So we're going to pick things up here in Acts chapter 2. We have a tendency, I think, when we look at Acts chapter 2, at least I do, when we talk about preaching or, or teaching from it in Acts chapter 2, we have a tendency to sort of focus on the beginning of the chapter. Um, we like verses sort of 1 through 8 where there's this description of wind and tongues of fire and this dramatic arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Or we have a tendency to kind of go to the end of the chapter, verses 42 through 47. We focus on this description of community that existed in the infancy of the church and the model, the prototype this is for genuine community for us even now. I think sometimes we forget, we overlook these, these middle verses in Acts chapter 2 where we see Peter deliver this incredible sermon. The first sermon ever recorded in the history of the church. And ultimately the, ser uh, the sermon that would launch the church into the ministry and the mission that God had set before it. So let's pick things up together now here in Acts chapter 2 verses 14. This is a, a we're going to read all the way through verse 41. So we're going to, um, this will be a big section of scripture. But let's hear this together. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk. We'll talk about that in a minute, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I shall pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall see dreams. Even the male servants and the female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the, shun, and the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David said concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced and my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will make full the gladness with your presence." Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ and that he was not abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. 
And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let's pause there. There's, there's this dramatic sermon that, that Peter delivers. And despite the fact that this sermon is, is ancient and that the cultural context is, is far different than our own today, I believe that this, this passage still teaches us some incredible truths about the nature of the gospel and how we as a church can continue to engage people with it to this day. And the first thing that stands out to me as we look at Acts chapter 2 that God reveals through his gospel is that it meets us where we are. It meets us where we are. I, I've never sort of noticed this before as I've looked at this passage that Peter's sermon here is, is in response to those who had just seen what has happened and were asking themselves, what does this mean? Again, back here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 12, slightly before this, the Holy Spirit has arrived in this dramatic fashion in verse 12, it says, Then they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others were mocking and said, They're filled with new wine. Here's Peter's response. But Peter then stood, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Peter here is responding to the needs of the people. Thousands upon thousands of people had gathered in Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost. And they were witnessing the impact, the result of the Holy Spirit's presence on the disciples. They're watching all of this take place. They're watching people share the mighty works of their God in languages that they did not even speak. As this is happening all around us, as they're witnessing them, the men and women who are seeing it were left wondering, what does all of this mean? What we have in this sermon that Peter delivers here in Acts chapter 2 is essentially speaking into that question. I think here we find a subtle and yet vital aspect of the nature of the gospel. And that is simply that the gospel meets us where we are. You see, the gospel meets us in the place of our unanswered questions. It meets us in the place of our disappointment uh, and when we are most disillusioned. The gospel meets us in our doubts and our discouragement. The gospel meets us in, in our brokenness. Much later in, in the book of Acts, as we continue to work through this together this year, uh, we're going to see another fantastic example of this. The Apostle Paul stands up before the Oropagus in Athens, and he presents the gospel um, when he sees an altar with the inception to the unknown God. You see, Paul understood that culture that he was speaking into. He understood the questions that they were asking. And he meets them in the place of that question. And he says, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus was the supreme example of this. The religious rulers were always irritated by the fact that Jesus could be seen eating with notorious sinners. Why? Because that's where they were. Because the people who needed him, the people that understood what it was that he was bringing, that's where they were and Jesus would meet them in that place. It reveals the heart of who he is. It reveals what's at the core of the gospel. I remember um, as a young pastor at a previous church, I, somebody wandered in in the middle of um, one of our services. Um, very disheveled um, pretty rough looking, um, clearly was not fitting in in this crowd. And so what do you do in that situation? You always tap on the shoulder of the youth pastor and say, go, go do something about that, right? You know? So I went over there and I began to talk to the guy and I started to ask him a few questions. I could see there were tears in his eyes. He was listening to the music. He was listening to the people sing. I don't know where he came from or, or how he sort of found his way in. But we talked for a little bit and he said to me, he said, one day I'm going to get myself cleaned up, and I'm going to come in there, I'm going to sing with that choir. I said, brother, don't, don't wait till you're cleaned up. Come sit with the rest of us who are messed up. This, this place, we're all just recovering hypocrites, right? Come, come sit with us, join us. Don't wait for that moment that you've got yourself good enough, that you think God finds you acceptable, and then you can come sing with us. 
Sing, sing now as you are. That's the thing about the gospel. We can spend much of our lives in this futile attempt to clean ourselves up. So we'll sort of be found acceptable to God. But the good news of the gospel is that it meets us in the place of our greatest need. And there it begins to do its work. I love how Peter starts at that point with the people. He moves on from there. And the second thing that we begin to discover, discover about God's work through the gospel is that it tells us the truth about ourselves. It tells us the truth about ourselves. I think that, that oftentimes in my head or that sometimes we as the church, we forget this important point. That the reality is, is that the gospel is offensive. Have you thought about that? The gospel is offensive because it begins by identifying things about ourselves that we would rather not see. Look at this again in, in uh, verses 22 and 23. Peter says to the people that are listening there, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed with the hands of lawless men. Again, down in verse 36. It says, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. First of all, when I think about this, you know, Peter was never the guy that you sent in to sort of handle a delicate situation. Um, he had a history of, of being impulsive, of, of being blunt, and, and sometimes even putting his foot in his mouth. And in this context here, Peter does not pull any punches with the ones who are listening to him. I, I read these verses through kind of my modern lens, and the hair on the back of my neck stands up because this feels so abrasive. You can't talk like that. But again, what I oftentimes forget is that before the gospel is redemptive, the gospel is offensive because it confronts sin as sin. We, we have to be careful on this, this point here because I think we have a tendency to go to one extreme or the other. Either I read this passage and, and it gives me free license to go around shouting about the sin of other people and I fail to realize that I stand among the guilty. That's my position. When I essentially fail to realize the qual this quality of the gospel in my own life, and when this happens, there's this massive loss of humility and the message of the gospel gets distracted by my own self-righteousness. I don't believe that reflects the gospel. But, but, but on the other hand, there's the other extreme, is, is in my attempts to be sensitive or in my efforts not to offend, I fail to ever call sin, sin. We can talk about personal freedoms and our rights and choices, but we fail to speak truth into each other's lives and into the world around us. To be honest, I'm not always sure personally or pastorally um, how we practically live this out in a balanced and God-honoring way. For me, and I, I get this might sound like a bit of a cop-out here, but for me, I really believe that we have to lean heavily. We have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit in our lives. To allow us to speak when we need to speak and to listen when we need to listen and to be honest and real about our own sin before we ask others to deal with theirs. But what I am convinced of is that when I err on either extreme, either speaking as one who sits in this position of judgment or failing to speak at all, then I am in fact acting in an unloving way and I am missing a vital aspect of the gospel. You see that this truth that we discover about ourselves in the gospel serves a greater purpose. And that's the third thing that we see in Peter's sermon is because it points us to Jesus. It points us to Jesus. This is Peter's ultimate conclusion here. 
and the purpose of the gospel. It points us to Jesus. The goal of the truth telling that we saw before about ourselves is not self-loathing or despair or hopelessness. The goal of this awareness of the spiritual disease of sin is meant to allow us to find the cure in Jesus Christ our Savior. Look again in Acts chapter 2. Verses 23 and 24, we just read this. It says, Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Verse 32 and 33. This Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then again in verse 39, and I love this. For this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I love the way Peter sees this. Peter immediately offers those who heard his voice the solution to their most fundamental and unresolvable problem, and it's Jesus. This is the gospel that that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but will have eternal life. This is the gospel that Christ carried my sin. He carried your sin to the cross. He took the punishment so that I could experience freedom. He died so that I could live. This is the gospel. Imagine for a moment the depths of that kind of love. When we even begin to grasp that, when that even begins to penetrate our life, it is overwhelming. And the beauty of it is is that it's, it's not been imposed on us. It has been poured out to us. This is the gospel. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sins. I love the way that Peter sums this up in Acts 2, saying about Jesus, this promise, this promise is for you. There's one last but vital truth that we see and that God shows us through his gospel and that is that he calls us to respond. He calls us to respond. See this again in verses 32 and 30, or no, excuse me, 37 and 38. Now they heard that, now, though, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the pro- apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we experience the truth of the gospel, when God meets us where we are, when he reveals to us the truth about ourselves and the gift that is available to us in Jesus, then we are left with the same question that they faced when they heard this sermon some 2,000 years ago. How will I respond? Verse 41 in this passage tells us that about 3,000 souls were added to their number that day. That's an incredible response. That's an incredible number of people who were placing their hope in Jesus Christ. But what strikes me is that everyone who heard Peter's message Everyone that heard his voice, everyone in that crowd responded. We know that some 3,000 people responded by saying yes, and they gave their lives to Christ. But everyone responded. You see, that's the thing about the gospel. It leaves no room for neutrality. It requires a response. It requires a decision. My hope and my prayer is that if you are here this evening, If you are hearing this, maybe perhaps for the very first time, if you have never acknowledged Christ as Savior, if you have never sought him for forgiveness and received the salvation that is available to you, my hope and my prayer, my plea to you would be don't wait any longer. Today is the day. 
Today is the day for you to make that decision. Secondarily, though, my hope and my prayer is that we would live out as a church this gospel message. That in this building, that, that in our families, our jobs, in our communities, that we would live this out in such a tangible and real way. What I believe we have available to us here in Acts chapter 2 is a model for how we as the church engage our culture with the gospel. This sermon that Peter delivered here would launch the church. And we want to continue to be about the business that was set free for us from the very beginning. Would you pray with me? Father, we do just come before you, Lord. That this Jesus, this Jesus that we read about in Acts chapter 2, who died and suffered on a cross so that we might sin, be saved. But we have hope because of you. God, don't allow that truth to go away today. Lord, make this a day of decision. Lord, I pray that we would be about this as a church. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.